but I, I will try my best to entertain you guys in the next 40 minutes uh, with the, uh, the newest results that we have got on this uh, Soundway Type Light uh, supercomputer. So first, uh, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the machine. Um, as David said, he, he has already been there. So, uh, so here I just explain a little bit more about the name of the machine. Uh, the English name is actually, I should say, didn't convey all the information that we want to convey in the Chinese name. So I've put the Chinese characters here. Uh, and I know you have a, a lot of the Chinese population there. So maybe uh, some of you also can read the Chinese characters on, on the screen. And anyway, the, the, the first uh, two characters on the first row actually corresponds to the uh, name of the family of this uh, supercomputer some way. And if you uh, uh, want to find out the meaning in Chinese, it actually means the, the power of the God. So uh, it's really some uh, you know, powerful supercomputer they want to make. And the actual name for this uh, spe specific machine is Taihu Light. Is uh, the first the two uh, characters on the second row corresponds to Taihu. It's actually a very big lake in China, as I pointed out on the slide. As you can see, it's close to the city of Shanghai. And the size is roughly also the same size as uh, the, the city of Shanghai. And so if you zoom in a little bit, as you can see here, it's, it's actually, you, you can see that it's a, it's a very um, active area in China. Actually, I, I should say in history is also one of the richest areas in China with a lot of uh, economic activities going on. And our machine is in the city of Wuxi uh, with, with this uh, um, largest uh, red circle shows on the map. And, and as you can see on, on the right, I listed a table. This is a table we call top 100 in China. So it's a list of cities um, depending on their GDPs. As you can see here, all these cities surrounded by the lake, they are very uh, strong in terms of uh, e economics in, in China. So that's also part of the reason that we choose to put the machine there. Uh, because, uh, you know, in China, uh, for supercomputing centers, we don't have the actual, actually the, the research funding to support the operation of the supercomputer. And as you can imagine, we, we need a lot of money to actually pay for the electricity and pay for the research stuff. So uh, we want a strong existence of uh, industry uh, around, around the supercomputer so that we can actually uh, support the supercomputer and we can also try to bring the benefits to the uh, uh, related com communities. So, as I mentioned, Sunway is actually a, a family of uh, supercomputers. Uh, although I guess before last year, not many people in the world knows about the Sunway family. But this uh, family of supercomputers actually uh, dated back to the year of 1998, when the first machine of Sunway was designed. But of course, at that time, it was still based on the uh, foreign commercial chips. And it was made for the Weather Agency of China trying to provide weather prediction uh, for the uh, a great par parrot uh, in the next year, 1999, for the 50 year anniversary for the foundation of People's Republic of China. So as you can see, weather is one of the traditional things that actually run on this uh, uh, family of supercomputers. Now the previous generation of Sunway type of light is uh, blue light. Is, is as it was also on the uh, top 500, not the first, but the 14th, and was also a machine uh, built by China's own uh, processors. So, and then if you look at the pictures, they actually share a lot of similarities. The first thing is the, the way that we organize the cabinets. Uh, David has been to the room, so he, he can tell you that it's, it's actually quite different from the other uh, supercomputers, we actually organize our computer cabinets as a circle uh, rather than rows or columns. And it's, it's kind of a special design of the Soundwave family. And, and also the processor also shares a lot of similarities. Uh, the processor of blue light is a 16 core processor, but also divided as four core groups. Each core group has four homogeneous cores. 
The 260 cores of the processor in some way type of light is also divided into four core groups. The difference is that we now have uh, different kinds of cores uh, in, in each core group. And so as you can see from this slide, this, this slide shows the architecture of the uh, uh, processor of this supercomputer, uh, which has 260 cores divided as four core groups. Each core group has one, what we call MP, uh, management processing element, which is more similar to traditional CPU cores. So this core can do all different kinds of tasks, uh, operating systems, communications, and also computations. Now for the CPE, which is organized as an eight by eight mesh, is uh, more like a computing engine for your applications. So these eight uh, by eight CPEs, they have both rows and columns to communicate. So they actually have a very efficient way to exchange data among the, among the threads on these different cores at the level of registers. That's what we call register communication, uh, which is the key feature of this uh, new processor. Okay, so on, on, uh, based on this processor, we then build up this system uh, along which we call a five level integration hierarchy. So the first one is about the computing boards. So in this one computing board, we actually have two processors. So that's like two nodes in, in one board. And then in this animation, you can see that we, we call this large board a sandwich board. So on the top of the sandwich, we have uh, two computing boards. At the bottom, we all have two of them, which is not shown in this animation. And then the middle is the cooling plate. So the entire system is liquid cooling. The liquid flows in the middle to take away the heat produced by these um, eight processors in this one sandwich board. And then we have uh, 32 of these boards going into one, what we call a super node. So in each super node, we have 256 uh, processors, which are fully connected by a customized network board, which actually sits behind this uh, uh, super node. And then four of the super nodes forms a cabinet. So actually in one cabinet, we already have uh, 1,024 processors that is providing a computing power of uh, three, roughly three petablocks. So you can see is a very densely integrated computing cabinet. And then we have 40 cabinets to, to form this uh, uh, supercomputer with 125 uh, petablocks of computing performance. So, um, this slide actually, again, summarizes how we actually connect these 10 million cores. Uh, as we have mentioned, we have this uh, eight by eight CPU mesh, and then with one MPE to kind of manage, manage this uh, uh, CPU mesh. And then four of them, four of these kind of core groups to form one processor, and 256 of them to form a super node with the customized uh, network board. So the communication, actually, the communication within this super node is very fast, uh, very smooth. And on top of that, we have what we call a Sunway net. That is uh, kind of similar to the other supercomputers. It's a fat tree architecture that uh, actually connects all these uh, uh, 40,000 CPUs in this uh, uh, system. Okay, so just to, to give you some comparison information, these two figures actually uh, sort of shows the uh, capabilities of this machine as compared to other supercomputers like Tianhe 2, Titan, or K computer. So the, the one, the figure on the left shows some of the physical, physical uh, information like peak, in, peak performance, uh, memory bandwidth, and, and so on. The one on the right actually shows some of the key benchmarks that people run on supercomputers. So as you can see, our advantages in terms of uh, peak performance is very, uh, is very clear. I mean, we have much more computing power than, than the other systems. And, and also, of course, the computing power per, per cubic meters, as you can see, we are very densely integrated. It's also uh, much better than the other systems. But in terms of memory, our memory capabilities is not very good. If you look at the um, K computer, our computer has like 10 times more computing power than K, but our memory size is roughly uh, the same as K computer. 
And our memory bandwidth is also not uh, very good. So as you can see, um, in this, uh, from, from this perspective, you may say this machine is not very well balanced. But I mean, I will talk afterwards how we actually solve these problems, but this is generally a decision that you have to make when you have a fixed budget to make your supercomputer. So as a result, uh, <clears throat> for the benchmarks on the right, you can see for, for the compute intensive benchmarks like Limpack and uh, HPA GMG, uh, Type 1 Lite is doing very good, which means it is good for dense matrix and also uh, finite difference, finite element methods, uh, explicit, explicit methods. Now for HPCG and graph, for graph we are the second uh, on the list, for HPCG we are the third. And for both of them, a K computer is still doing the best in the world. Uh, and that's also uh, because I should say K computer has, has a much larger budget than our machine and it has uh, poured a lot of more resource uh, along the um, memory capabilities of the machine. So, um, in this slide, I just tried to summarize some of the major factors of this machine. Uh, Type Lite is, of course, very large, 200, uh, 125 petaflops performance over 10 million cores. And uh, in terms of memory, it's not very good. 32 gigabytes memory per node, uh, 136 gigabytes per second uh, for each node. And if you compute the ratio of computation and memory, uh, that is roughly 22 flops per byte. Okay, that is actually very high. If you, if you, uh, if you compare with some other sort of uh, um, after, uh, you know, state-of-the-art many-core architectures like uh, the new Xeon 5 people use on Cori and the P100 GPUs on um, P-Stained, uh, their numbers are six and seven, which means uh, although we have, we have a similar computing performance to these new chips, but our memory bandwidth is very limited. And, and also, uh, we have some different features on the memory. As I, as I mentioned, uh, we have this register communication that we can use to achieve very efficient communication among the CPEs. And also for the CPEs, we don't have air one catch. And instead, we have a user controlled uh, scratch pad, a fast fiber, uh, which is 64 kilobytes for each of the CPEs. So for this machine, uh, one thing, uh, the, the first challenge is, of course, you have a much larger scale than before. Uh, you can compute something with 10 million cores. <laughs> That's always the most uh, exciting part and also the most diffi difficult part. You have to figure out a way to uh, scale your problem to the 10 million cores that we have on the system. Now, the second challenge of, is, of course, the memory part. As I mentioned, our memory capability is not uh, at so good uh, as our computing performance. So we have to figure out a way to, to, to resolve this. And as I mentioned, usually these um, uh, 64 kilobytes, actually in, in a lot of the allocations that we are looking at, this uh, 64 kilobytes of buffer is good enough for you to deal with um, most of the computing kernels that you want to accelerate on the many core architecture. And also the rest of your communication can uh, can uh, help you quite a bit uh, along the way. But of course, to achieve that, you need to spend uh, tremendous efforts to refactor your code, to redesign your algorithm, you know, trying to make it sort of uh, more suitable for, the, for this um, new hardware architecture. Okay, so that's about ma the machine and also the major challenges as we see for the machine. So now uh, I would talk a little bit about how we actually program things on this machine. So the programming model on Sunway Type Light uh, is kind of similar to the other supercomputers, heterogeneous supercomputers, is what we call nowadays MPI plus X. So we also provide two different uh, options here. One option is uh, OpenACC. So we are actually an official member of the OpenACC uh, consortium and we are trying to we actually made some customizations. All OpenACC is slightly different from the OpenACC standard of NVIDIA. We have added some features, which is for the different uh, uh, architectural, uh, architectural features of this uh, processor. And the second option is ASRAD. So this is similar to the OpenACC and CUDA options that you have on GPU. If you have some very regular loops, you can 
use OpenACC to quickly convert it onto this new architecture. If you have something that is not very good, not very suitable for the uh, Manico architecture, you probably want to rewrite it uh, using ASRA. So, uh, and about the two challenges we, we saw, uh, we, we have discussed uh, earlier. Uh, the first thing is about the scaling of 10 million cores. And in general, we do a two level approach, which corresponds to the MPI plus X uh, programming model. The first level is the traditional MPI decompositions. And uh, in our architecture, usually, as I mentioned, in each processor, we have four core groups. Usually we assign one MPI process to each of the core groups. So in this system, you can have up to uh, 160,000 different MPI processes. Now the second level is the 65 or 64 cores in each core group that you can make use of. Usually we, we do that by, um, by spreading, either using OpenACC or ASRAP. So as you can see here, the key part is when you design your parallelization scheme or say decomposition scheme, you need to make sure that you have to reserve enough parallelism. After your MPI process, you, you, you need to still have enough parallelism for the 65 cores in each core group. And in many cases, you probably want to redesign your algorithm to expose some more um, parallelism for, for this uh, supercomputer. And the second part is, again, for the memory issues, in general, we have to do two things. The first thing is to design a DMA uh, transfer scheme. So as I said, for each uh, CPE, we have this 64 kilobytes uh, buffer that needs to be managed by the programmers. So instead of uh, accessing the data from the main memory directly, usually what you want to do is to do DMA transfer to fetch the data into the fast buffer, and then you compute from there. So it's very important that you do asynchronous DMA operations so that you can actually overlap the computation parts and the memory operation parts. In this way, you can get good results. And the second approach is, of course, I have mentioned the data sharing. In a lot of the uh, problems like uh, standard source and other operations, you will find that you have the chance to get very good data sharing among the different threads of different CPEs by using the register communication uh, feature I've mentioned earlier. So here, I just want to give you uh, a number of examples. So here, I, 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 I call this uh, list. It's actually an incom incomplete list of uh, four scale applications that can actually run on this supercomputer nowadays. So uh, I think now we have roughly 14 or 15 applications that can actually use all the 10 million cores of this supercomputer. And as you can see from the names, uh, it pretty much you know, covers all the major domains uh, of uh, high performance computing applications. And we also have some new things like uh, for graph, for graph processing, uh, we have a research team also from, from the same university, from Tsinghua University, uh, who managed to use the entire machine to do a graph processing uh, for a local internet company in, in China. So, um, so last year we, we actually, so among these different applications, we have three of them uh, uh, which were selected as the Golden Bell uh, finalists. So uh, if, if, you, if you're not very familiar with the Golden Bell Prize, it's actually uh, one of the most uh, prestigious uh, awards for high performance computing applications is, uh, is, you know, people try to run the extreme scale scientific problems on the largest uh, supercomputers. So last year we have three of them uh, in the finalists and we have one of them that actually won the prize uh, is, is a very big excitement for us because it's the first time that actually a research team from China that actually won this, uh, won this prize. And also this year we have two of them to be selected as the finalists. So these are actually all traditional HPC uh, application domains. As you can see, two of them are about climate modeling, uh, about atmospheric modeling. And the other one of them is about earthquake, earthquake simulation. So I will talk about these uh, three briefly to uh, give you uh, some ideas about how we actually 
design algorithms and program on, on this um, supercomputer. So the first example is, is the uh, Golden Bell Prize work last year. It's an implicit solver for atmospheric dynamics. So on this slide, we list some of the major things. So for the algorithm part, we do domain decomposition, multi-grid uh, solvers to use uh, this 10 million cores. And especially we have a customized incomplete ARU uh, preconditioner on, on this, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this work. So we were able to uh, scale to the entire machine 10 million cores with a sustained performance of eight petaflops. That is actually a very good result, a result for, for uh, implicit, uh, implicit solvers. And we were very excited to, of course, to win the prize last year. And, and as, as I mentioned, the first part, the key part, the first key part is always how you, how you are going to paralyze, uh, paralyze your design. So in this way, uh, in, in, this, in this work, it's also done in, in two uh, different steps. In the first step, we need to have a scheme for the 160,000 MPI processes. So what we, what we do is a domain decomposition multi-grid. Uh, implicit solver for for this uh, work, but in this work we are actually using a very shallow uh, multi grid solver. So instead of have instead of instead of having maybe seven or eight different levels, we only have three different levels in this uh, in this multi grid solver. Now, one major consideration is that we still need to reserve, as I mentioned earlier, we need to reserve some enough parallelism that we can then allocate to the 60, 64 different cores. Uh, afterwards. So in this one, we are using a very shallow uh, multi-grid solver and we are using a uniform domain decomposition uh, to get the uh, domains that can then what we call uh, be plug and play into the subdomain solvers. So that's, that's for the first part to get it scalable at least uh, over 160,000 MPI processes. The next step is about the uh, 65 cores. Uh, how, how we use them to actually solve the, the matrix. The most difficult part is actually uh, in this solver is the IRU part. The other parts, as you can imagine, the matrix uh, uh, vector multipl multipl multiplication is kind of easier to paralyze, but the IRU is, is not very easy to, to paralyze in this case. So our goal of designing this one is to get uh, an IRU that, it, that only requires one single sweep and can be synchronization free, and also it has improved data locality among the different threads. And what we get is this uh, uh, customized algorithm, what we call it is a geometry-based pipeline IRU. So in this figure, you can actually see that the computation is performed along two different pipelines. The first pipeline is along the Z axis, so it's, it's kind of similar to the other stencil operations people do on the GPUs. So each thread is going to be iterating along this uh, Z axis. Now the other pipeline is along the X and Y plane. It's about how you actually start the uh, different threads. Uh, so as I mentioned, we want, we want it to be synchronization free. So what we do is we start the thread in the corner first. And after it computes the first level, it will send the data, the data items to its neighboring threads. Uh, so the neighboring threads, after receiving these data, they can actually start their processing as well. So in this way, all the threads will be initialized and then they can compute continuously. Now, of course, this cannot be achieved if we don't have the register communication feature uh, in this uh, architecture. The data sharing among the different threads is a key part in, in this uh, algorithm. And then by doing this, we, we can actually scale the solver uh, up to the entire machine uh, of 10 million cores. So here are just some uh, strong scaling results. Uh, for the two kilometer resolution, which we have obviously more points to compute, we can achieve a parallel efficiency of 67%. And for three kilometer is 45%. And this, the, the one on the left is the Golden Bell Prize of uh, 2015. It's also an implicit solver, but it's for homogeneous uh, uh, machine. Uh, it's, it's on the Sequoia, Sequoia supercomputer, and their parallel, parallel efficiency is 33%. So as you can see, we are actually achieving a very good scaling 
on strong scaling on, on this machine. And another major thing we did for this work is that we actually uh, have compared the results of both implicit solvers and explicit solvers on this supercomputer. So um, uh, David actually introduced the, our work uh, was not started on Taiku Light. Our work actually starts from uh, Tianhe 1A to Tianhe 2, and then in the very end, we, we uh, moved the work to uh, Stanway Taiku Light. And in the very beginning, our work was using the explicit solvers instead of implicit solvers. It's only tier Taiku Lights. Uh, we move our direction to the implicit solvers. So we actually have both of them uh, optimized on this uh, supercomputer, and we actually compare the performance uh, of these two. So as you can see, the, the performance, the computing performance, the flops of implicit solver is only eight. And for explicit solver is 23.6. So the explicit solver is of course, uh, you know, getting better flops. But if you look at the real simulation speed, like how many years that you can actually simulate uh, by using one day of this supercomputer, this implicit approach is actually 90, roughly 90 times faster than the explicit solver. So, um, you know, of course, this is still at the scale of solvers. We still need some time to actually tune this into a real, uh, you know, practical dynamic core for the atmospheric models. But I think this gives some very uh, interesting insights for people are looking at these uh, problems. Okay, so this, this, uh, so that was the first example. And the second example is also related to uh, uh, atmospheric modeling, uh, as you can see here. But this, uh, this time, the challenge is much more different. Uh, in the first work, what, what we did was actually we designed something from scratch for this uh, new supercomputer. But in the second work, what we, tr what we were trying to do is actually to port some existing scientific code very large scale, you know, millions of lines of code onto this uh, new supercomputer. So this project actually starts quite early. Uh, we, we started this work in the summer two years ago, even before the supercomputer was ready. So we had a, a very large team with professors and students from many different, uh, you know, universities and, and uh, you know, uh, different departments. Uh, and well, we did get some results. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, uh, it was not a very easy task, as you can imagine. There were a lot of uh, challenges, uh, as we see here. The first thing is, of course, we have mentioned this is a very complex uh, existing code, millions of lines of code. And the other thing is, it was written along a very uh, long period of time, you know, over two or three decades. So in the code, you see a lot of uh, different generations of Fortran, you know, Fortran 77, Fortran 90 or the newest Fortran. So uh, it's very difficult to read. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a code with no clear plots. You know, it has a lot of different functions. Each function is, you know, the largest function might be just taking 5% of the in, entire computing time. So you either have to refactor the entire thing or you are not going to achieve any, you know, clear uh, performance benefits. And also, of course, these codes were all written for the previous you know, multi-core processors. Uh, when they design the code, they never consider about the new architecture. So there's this uh, misfit between the uh, software and hardware. Now, of course, as I see here, the, the biggest uh, problem is that we don't really have people who, you know, sit in both worlds. Uh, I, I, it, when I look back, I think, I think the biggest mistake I made was that the team was, was or, you know, was mainly made up of computer science students. So we, we have actually trained the computer science students to work on this project in the summer two years ago. But after three months, uh, we only have two or three of them left. The other guys were all, you know, they, they, they came to me and, and they were saying, you know, uh, Professor, I'm, I'm, uh, I had enough of this. You have to switch me to deep learning. Otherwise, I will quit my PhD. You know, so. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a really uh, a tough challenge and we don't see a clear uh, solution to this, but in, in our universities, we are trying to start some, you know, uh, multidisciplinary programs that train students actually along both sides so that these guys can actually, you know, uh, work on the climate codes much better than, than we do. 
So uh, what we did uh, in, the, in the web beginning was, was based on the OpenACC. You know, it's very large code, so we can't really, you know, rewrite all of them. So we used the OpenACC to transform the loops into the code that is suitable for this uh, new supercomputer. So that's our first step. And as you can see here, we are getting some performance results. We, we are scaling this to uh, 240 uh, sorry, 24,000 MPI processes, roughly 1.5 million cores. But the performance we get is roughly the same as Intel. So it's, it's not very, I should say, very exciting results. So what, what, we, what we then did was to uh, redesign the thing. We want to really make it suitable for this uh, uh, new architecture, so this new supercomputer. So we, we try to rewrite all these things. We try to even adjust the sum of the algorithms as I said, to expose more parallelism for the uh, many core architecture. So here, here are some results that you can see here. Um, we have different uh, columns here. So actually, the, the first the first bar shows the one the the the, uh, the uniform one performance uh, is the performance we get on the on one Intel core, and the uh, second bar is the performance of one MP. So it's just right after we port the code onto the MP, you can see that our performance is, you know, is like one fourth or even one tenth of an Intel core. As you can imagine, our core is much simplified, much more simplified than Intel core, and the frequency is not also not very high. And and so third bar is after the OpenACC refactor, and you can see there we are getting similar or in some cases better performance than the Intel core. But it's only in the last bar is where we did the A-thread redesign where I get some real performance here. So, so by, doing that, by doing that, we get uh, you know, a equivalent performance to seven or eight cores, or in some cases, you know, equivalent to 43 Intel cores. And after that, we were able to actually scale the dynamic core of the KMSE to eight million cores on this supercomputer and achieve the uh, performance of 1.6 petaflops. Okay, I, I'm probably running uh, slow here. So uh, the, the, the third example here is about the earthquake simulation. Uh, so this was actually, this uh, was uh, some collaboration initialized uh, uh, by Dr. Tsui, Yifeng Tsui from SCAC in, in US. So we tried to actually also redesign their code on our supercomputer. So even though our, our processors is only having one third memory bandwidth of the GPUs on Titan, after the redesign, we are achieving the same kind of computing efficiency as Titan. And, and we, are, we, we are now able to perform 10 hertz nonlinear simulation for large scale scenarios. And, and also along the way, the, the, the first part is of course, we, we completely redesigned the, the decomposition scheme. Uh, for, for this supercomputer. We need much more different levels of decomposition and, and also we did a lot of blocking, uh, which is mainly targeted for the 64 kilobytes uh, faster buffer in, in this case. And also the memory, the memory thing is very important. As we said, we have much less memory bandwidth, but we were able to achieve the same kind of computing efficiency. So we did a lot of array fusion to try to, you know, uh, identifying the arrays that actually work together. And then we, we, we make, actually we make very good utilization of the register communication for the halo exchange in this uh, uh, finite difference the stencil uh, application. So as you can see here, uh, we are achieving very good performance on our CPEs. And in the last case, uh, you know, when we scale to the full machine, as you can see uh, for the table, for the table on, on, the, on, the, on the left, we are pretty much, you know, sort of pushing all the memory things to the limit. We are using, you know, all the bandwidth, all the fast buffer and all the memory that we can use for, for this problem. And by doing, by doing that, we're achieving, you know, the same, similar or say slightly better computing efficiency than what they get on Titan. And we achieved a performance of 15 petaflops for, for this, uh, uh, specific application. Okay, so that's for the uh, application examples. 
So in the in the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about the the plans for for this uh, supercomputer. So we actually have very big pressure on our shoulders. As I as I said, we we are supposed to be self sustainable, which means we need to uh, earn the money that actually supports the machine. So the first step we're thinking is trying to convert the science, the research. The research we had on this machine into kind of service for the government agencies. So the first part is the climate simulation and the second part is the earthquake uh, simulation. We actually are already starting very uh, strong uh, collaborations with the National Climate Center located in Beijing. So they are planning to put a number of their uh, uh, service, you know, their routine services on our uh, supercomputers for high resolution. Uh, scenarios and the second the second part is deep learning we we are trying to uh, start some collaboration with some of the local uh, internet companies some of you uh, might might uh, heard of like Baidu and Tencent so uh, I think last month we just uh, when 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 Baidu was announcing their new AI operating system we also announced our collaboration sort of long-term strategic collaboration with them to develop this uh, deep learning framework on our uh, some way many core architectures. Uh, so this is uh, just uh, some, you know, so, sort of uh, uh, preliminary results. As you can see here for deep learning uh, training parts, this processor is actually quite strong. So each uh, core group is providing equivalent performance to, uh, uh, in this case, I think 60 or 70 intercores. So which is, is a pretty good uh, efficiency. And, and also uh, actually a few months, one month ago in, in, in Germany, we announced the Soundway Micro. So we are going to have uh, you know, customized uh, Soundway servers for people around the world. So if any of you would be interested to play with the machine, we actually would ship it uh, you know, somewhere after August. Uh, so David, if you want to buy one, just let me know. <laughs> and uh, okay, so that's, that's the major contents of the, the uh, talk. And I should acknowledge the, uh, the um, uh, Ministry of Science and Technology, which is the major sponsor of the machine, and our CPC could design and make uh, this uh, splendid machine. And also I want to thank uh, my friends from NCAR and also SCAC who uh, collaborated with us on the uh, CAM and, and the uh, Earth, earthquake simulation work. Okay, so thank you for listening.